second keynote speaker of the day is Alicio uh, Granisi um, with a hybrid background between design and technology. Alicio is a prototype engineer at Magic Leap. Um, he studied architecture at SciArc um, as an interested in AR and VR meeting human interaction in the context of an augmented reality cloud. He taught Unity workshops internationally, uh, exhibited work in art galleries, published multiple articles about AR and VR on platforms such as Design Boom, Arc Daily, and Forbes. And we are very happy to have him join us to, to uh, give a presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very great. Also, I was your student, Scott, so. <laughs> <laughs> that too, as well. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation, everyone. And uh, really looking forward to showcase some of the, my investigation work. And really thank you for the great opportunity. It's really, it's really an honor for me. Um, should I get started? Um, can I start sharing? Go right ahead. I think you can share. All right. You should be able to. Let's share the screen here. Looking good. Can you guys see it? Not quite full screen, but it's uh, it's up. Let me see if I can present. Can you see full screen right now? Oh, let's, did I tell you that Alessio is good. presenting on XR and social justice? Can you guys hear? Yes, that's looking good now. And All right, great. So I'm going to start. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, this the brief of this uh, of this talk is about like uh, social justice. I would like to approach it in a very particular way, uh, kind of starting from very far, and then like I want to also leave uh, a lot of room for students to have a conversation with me. I would love if there are questions. I would love if there is any concern or interested in augmented reality. Uh, I would be very very glad to, to answer to that. Um, I would like to start from a question that I, it's a question that I hear from everyone that I, let's say friends or relatives and anyone that knows the work that I'm doing, but maybe for some reasons is not directly familiar with augmented reality. And I, and I heard about, and I heard this question a lot also in architecture school because having like a design background, uh, I am really being uh, um, discovering augmented reality in a design scenario. So a lot of people were skeptical. A lot of people were actually super excited about it. There is a very controversial, uh, controversial uh, approach to it. And I thought it was interesting to bring it up also because uh, I'm talking to students. So I really see myself in every one of the students that are just taking a look at the, at the presentation. So uh, often I, I heard that uh, augmented reality is not tangible, so you cannot prove it, like it's not really helpful, uh, you can live without it, or it's just a face filter, it's just virtual, it looks bad, it's, my render looks better, like, you know, like, very often hear this in presentation, like, uh, that doesn't get the point through, I, I'm going to make a render, don't worry, uh, it doesn't work very well, I tried, it's not stable, I, I don't get it, like, uh, and all of these things, right? Uh, but like, you know, like I really think that it's important to think about uh, augmented reality as a system that works on top of things and not a standalone system itself. Uh, what would you do if your computer cannot go on the internet? Uh, would you still use it? Uh, how many times during the day do you think you would use your computer if you cannot use internet? So uh, I think it should be live as a system. Uh, and understood as something on top of other things and having a very, start to understand like the technology from a very wide uh, point of view. And I always like to bring this example to everyone who tells me that the relevance of uh, augmented reality is quite uh, misunderstood. Um, Eve, can you prove from this distance where are these people here in the crowd that that part of the building is actually a real part of the building? Is that tangible? Can you prove from this distance that that part of the building is something real? Uh, of course, this is an extreme example, 
but like what I want to just uh, class with these images is the fact that like sometimes you really don't need to prove that sometimes it's tangible to have an impact of these things in your life. We see it every day with socials and uh, all, a lot of other technologies uh, that we not necessarily need to touch them to make them feel that they are helping us or something like that. So I think that augmented reality is like a great opportunity for merging those two parts of physical and digital. Uh, so definitely the physical part of our life is losing value and value every day. Uh, we saw it during quarantine, we saw it during COVID. Uh, we saw that we are capable of doing everything from our houses, from our homes. Uh, so, uh, but still augmented reality is a, is a way, is an opportunity for, for us. So uh, over analyzing this point and stressing it out a little, uh, what actually makes any virtual product, uh, something that is relevant enough to be unavoidable. And then from the unavoidable side of the, of the product, you can start to think about that that is going to become helpful. Um, I, I bring up the example of Facebook. Everyone, when I talk about Facebook and social media, uh, they tend to say, oh, Facebook's, Facebook is bad, social media are bad. Like they just like, they just mess up with your brain and all of these things, but still, every one of those people is on Facebook. So it's really much of a contradiction. And um, uh, we need to understand that we need these tools because people are becoming a lot and we need to handle our relations and we need to handle all of this data that we have in our lives right now. Like it's, it's incredible how many things we, we are handling as an individual. So uh, we really need to also transpose these thoughts into an architectural design and understanding that the horizons are expanding quite a lot and we need to really keep up with, the, with, the, with all of those things. So I would approach uh, the problem pragmatically from two different points of view. The first one is more of a literal approach. And so really showing some augmented reality experience that can hype you up and can see, it can let you understand what's the potential of the media. And the other one is more of an invisible point of view that makes really understand what is the environment that supports augmented reality and not necessarily just the augmented reality in cells. What I like to see, what I like to, to always like um, say when I talk about augmented reality is like you, you could make an augmented reality experience without using augmented reality until the very last days that you are making those augmented reality experiences is really about the environment that you're creating and eventually you choose the output to be augmented reality and uh and then you you create the impact to actually the product that you that you made through your design through your thoughts and through all of these things that that you include in your experience um so here is like a a video from my uh thesis at sire there might be the volume, so let me turn it off because I don't wanna um, don't wanna just talk on top of it. Internet is delaying. All right. So this video is a video from um, Sayark, and I was I was doing my thesis with my collaborator Runze. And uh, we were very excited about augmented reality. We thought it was the next thing. And we both ended up being working for augmented reality companies. And uh, we were super excited at the moment, but we also understood that the, the, the technology itself really need to be uh, on top of something else. So we choose, for example, here, a lot of different sites uh, in the city of LA and try to build a communication system between sites that in this, in this case are parking lots. So you could like see your friends or see your different, different cities uh, from one parking lot to the other one. We really enjoy this kind of visually from a visual point of view, we start making CGI experiences. We start making demos. We collect so much data. We have also an Instagram account with more 150 sites that we visited and we build like custom our experiences with our foundation before you on top of it. And uh, it was just a very exciting time for us to, to understand better the technology and to understand the potential and, uh, and maintaining this great relationship that we have visually because in the end, when you are in architecture school, what works is always the final 
visual that you are delivering, uh, which is uh, totally something uh, uh, still appealing for tech as well, because in the end, uh, it's very important how this thing works. And that's why a lot of tech companies has product design teams and all of these things, right? Um, so without uh, getting too, too much in the detail, um, I have some problems here. Without, some pro um, without getting too much in detail, that is just what I wanted to show in terms of hyping you up in terms of augmented reality. But then like, let's go back on the social justice topic that we are analyzing now, how augmented reality can, used, can be used uh, for a social justice purpose, for example. And here I'm bringing, I'm bringing up the example of uh, Jesse Escobedo that is actually an ex-USC student. So I'm very glad that I'm bringing some work of her here. And uh, she made this application, which allows citizens of LA to uh, just like drop some um, some elements around the streets of LA and just like think the city how the city should be changing according to certain data, according to certain community that is underdeveloped or they deserve more development. Uh, there is a lot of depth in this project, and it really like makes everything everyone expressed themselves in a very individual way and a very accessible way. So that was an incredible project in my opinion that I always like to bring it up in this case and express fully the, the potential of augmented reality. It really helps people visually, it's very intuitive and you can, describe, you can just change the CD as you would like. And it goes into this centralized system that can be eventually be seen by uh, the uh, city council or, or everyone that really take a look at all of the opinion of the other people instead of comments, instead of text. So this is like a very, very, uh, very strong way to, to communicate. Another project that I would like to bring up, and this is more of, um, uh, let's say, um, another example of the potential of augmented reality. Here I was doing a uh, a workshop in the city of um, Shanghai in China. And we, uh, we had a class of students that really focused on one site specifically for doing some augmented reality experience. Here's on the right, you can see a kind of diagram of the urban condition that we analyzed. Uh, there are in, in, in Shanghai, like many other uh, Chinese cities, uh, there are a lot of uh, elevated pedestrian paths because people uh, are so many that they need to have almost like a double high platform to travel around the city. Um, so uh, in this case, we noticed that a lot of billboards were very visible when you were on top of these platforms. So they were really in your face. And, um, and you know, like augmented reality is a great tool when you come down to image tracking because the image tracking is a very reliable anchor in the environment. If there is a, a great contrast between colors, it really makes it easy to map something. And uh, it's probably still uh, uh, today one of the most reliable anchors for augmented reality. So we thought about building experiences out of uh, billboards. And in this case, the, top, the main topics was advertisement, but you could easily understand how this thing could be evolving more in different directions and having like better purposes. For example, some students create a program for recycles, for education and recycles inside of the city. And there were all of these kind of very nice uh, proposal from the students. And uh, this is just to, un to, to, to understand once again that augmented reality doesn't work in itself alone. It needs to really have like a depth depth and thoughts behind it like any design project that you are that you're building so uh, it's very close to architecture in my opinion for the purpose of is a very deep field where, the, where you need to think a lot before actually to do something and and otherwise it really becomes to have like a very flat impact if you just do something that everyone else is doing um another example other examples can be approached not that literally, so not really building like application that shows you something, but more of, uh, and this goes more into the, the field of IoT, smart devices, and what architecture could be eventually in the future. So this is not related 100% to augmented reality, but this could be actually very impactful. And here um, I bring the example of Spatial Inc. That is a reference that actually a colleague of mine uh, pointed me to. His name is Mike. And uh, 
so this is the, the, the acoustic of the environment of the smart cities is being for me a topic that came into my life like last month, uh, thanks to actually a USC student, it's called Yufan, and he invited me to some uh, uh, talks with Daniel Kish, that is the president of the World Access for Blindness. And you know, at the first moment I was thinking how augmented reality actually can start to help blind people. Like this for me was a great investi like a great inter uh, question and because it's a very visual, uh, it's a very visual subject. And I, and I was like, I, I don't know what to do and what to say in this case, because I really don't want to sound offensive or anything, right? Or I don't want a lack of respect or just bringing augmented reality out for no reason. Uh, but the point is that even there, uh, it's not really about the visual itself. It's really about the system that you're hooking this, this, this thing up. So in here we have the, this, the, this, um, this company is well known for doing uh, audio experience at an urban scale. So allows you to have like very strong uh, um, uh, specialized audio in the environment. So if you have like uh, some visual that are adapting to all of those audio system uh, and everyone is kind of having the same platform with, it, with, it, with himself, like the main point that, that I wanna make is like, it could allow you to uh, to help these people as a not blind person, you could help actually blind person to understand where where are they going, what they want to do, like how they move in the environment. You can track some motions and all of these things that is very possible with augmented reality and GPS. And um, and from another perspective here, we enter also in the domain of privacy. So we were talking to uh, to Daniel during this talk, and he was saying basically that the best experience he had was with the specializer from Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, and uh, you know, like uh, it's great to hear that he tested the Microsoft HoloLens as a blind person and he tried and he understood that this kind of weight audio is embedded into those devices is superior than that headphones or other things because there is all of, a, uh, all of an audio that you can hook up to, uh, to uh, virtual environments. So once again, we, we are building virtual environments and we are changing audio based on circumstances around us. So definitely super important. And um, another experience that I'm bringing here is an experience that I worked on for a nonprofit organization in Italy where they were looking for uh, XR experiences for hospitalized children. So they could not move, they could not use their hands, they could not do anything. And still, uh, um, this, is, this is the device that I use is the Magic Leap one. And uh, you can really use your, um, you can really use these interfaces just with the motion of your eyes, which is incredible, right? The potential that this application give you because you don't need arms and you don't need motion. So you could really uh, uh, have a full uh, working computer without moving a finger. And uh, in this case, the experience was for children. So it was very relaxing, very, um, very focused on something that was easy to to look at and was moving based on your head position so it was really like crafted for your uh, smaller motion but something important that this prototype was actually doing was that it was possibly capturing information based on what you were watching right like so if you're watching certain elements if you're watching certain colors you can you can see you can extract how much of that color you were looking at and make more, more and more like investigation for doctors that are treating these patients uh, for for stimulating them eventually as well, or understanding what kind of uh, what kind of experience uh, could be actually more relevant than others. So it's been a very interesting project for me, even if it's looking as a fairy tale a cartoon. It was actually behind a very core uh, foundation of the eye tracking technology, and. Um, <clears throat> Another project that I'm working on for uh, the uh, Dai An Angewante uh, school that I don't know if I pronounce it uh, correctly, but I'm working with uh, in collaboration with Kayo that is also a, an ex -Syrk student. He's interested in a lot of uh, AI simulations for crowds in a big multi-complex building. And we, we brought this environment into Unity and am I kind of working in this direction, 
creating uh, augmented artificial intelligence um, uh, agents that are uh, working in the same moment where we are instantiating a lot of crowd simulation in the environment. So we have two different crowds, one that is kind of passive and one that is kind of learning from the other one. Uh, and then we will deploy all of this visualization in augmented reality, eventually from a smaller scale to a real scale. It's super exciting project and really let you understand again, what's the potential here with augmented reality. And this is like a real, uh, this is the marked hall by Emer Emer TV architects. Uh, so I guess everyone that went to architecture school knows what this project is. And it really provide a perfect environment for um, artificial intelligence agents. And uh, we are hypothesizing to deploy uh, 50 numbers of Boston Dynamics uh, spots uh, devices in the environment to gather data about people walking in the environment in that specific time of the day. So it's a very exciting project that I'm uh, thrilled to be part of and um, still showcasing what you can do with augmented reality and artificial intelligence together as well. And these are some uh, work from the students. Um, it's really based on uh, spatial patterns and understanding what groups of people it goes very, very deep into what are the, the way to organize spaces. Like this is really like what's the next step for architecture is really like smart spaces, how to organize them, how to leave them after you build them or how to build them based on some condition that are actually out there. And uh, I just want to bring some conclusions and then leave uh, some room for questions or anything that you think would be relevant here. Uh, I just want to say from a designer point of view, uh, think to, to, to build space as a proxy environment. That means uh, as you build a model that is a reduced scale of, a, of an environment, try also to interactively test that environment. Uh, even if you don't build a house as it should be, like you can still have very much a lot of relevant data uh, uh, dynamically and virtually. So you really need to kind of dig into these tools for getting the best out of what you actually build. Like when you do a massing or when you do something, test it, like test it with the, with the tools that you have available. And uh, another thing that I wanted to say is like the higher your impact, and the higher is the level of change that you can bring oh, no. inside of your field, right? <laughs> Look at the sun. Look at the dog. <laughs> I don't know who was that, but it was fun. And uh, <laughs> and uh, and then for the final the final point is like master your spatial ability and see things from a wide range of perspective. So uh, uh, we are we are used to to have a lot of. Uh, a lot of 2D representation and virtual represent and visual representation like renders, but really start to think about how your thing looks if you're looking at it from every point of view. That's the real challenge. It's going to be like how you're gonna live inside of it from every point of view. So that's actually an opportunity that augmented reality, virtual reality gives you. So in that in that sense, um, I I want I want to push you to do that. And uh, to end up everything, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, I sometimes I update stuff. And um, really, thanks for the great opportunity. I hope that you guys have questions, or if you want to just follow up separately, I would be happy to answer. Uh, and I think Jamil has a uh, raised hand. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Hi, uh, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the space of uh, non-fungible tokens. Um, it's becoming a very um, popular, say, trend right now. Um, I know recently many architectural um, websites and publications have been speaking on it because um, artists have created digital architecture and um, sold it for hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And um, I was uh, working with uh, a couple of cohorts and uh, we were looking at these designs and you know, investigating how we as architects can really insert ourselves in this space, um, you know, using uh, AR and, um, and VR capabilities. So um, I guess my question is, um, 
uh, how do you see the value of this space of um, NFTs and, and crypto um, being used um, as something helpful um, opposed to something that's uh, viewed as a, as a negative thing or it's, it's a disruptor in um, the, the art market? Um, yeah, I just want to get your thoughts on that. I'm really glad about this question because I was not sure if I wanted to include any blockchain principle in the presentation uh, or not, but I always, I'm always afraid because there are so many different points of views on this topic at the, at the moment that I don't want to run in any trouble, I have to be honest. But at the same moment, uh, I have to also be honest about my point of view and I'm glad that you asked me. I, I really believe that change is happening now. It's unavoidable. Um, uh, NFTs is just the peak of the iceberg of what is happening right now. Um, uh, I have a foundation account as well. Uh, I am really passionate about following all of these artists doing their own things. Uh, I'm really passionate to follow up what blockchain is evolving into. Uh, kind of risky environment, of course. Uh, I can't really say that it's going to be like that. Nobody could say that until it happens. Uh, but definitely for, um, for designers, I can see the opportunity to have a different own level of ownership, right? So like, like artists right now have a certain ownership on their token that are digital. Um, I, really, I really stress this concept uh, in, a sim in the same way, but very different also in some other articles I've been writing. The fact that right now architects don't have to need to be worried just about making a building, but also handling this building, administrating this building, and uh, what is uh, and being aware of all of the smart devices that are going to be inside of this building, like deeping your knowledge and eventually uh, uh, own some of the process that will be applied to this building, because I don't think it's fair. Uh, that you just like uh, make something and then you just give it away and this becomes space of someone else, right? And then uh, you are cut out, of, you're cut out of the game in a way. Uh, this is how our practice works. Um, you don't go farther than that. I don't think it's wrong. It's just uh, something that is going to be changing. And there are some architecture studio that are doing it uh, well. There are others that are, don't want to accept that uh, or are uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, even here, there is a very split train of thoughts uh, regarding the environment, but definitely, definitely NFT space. Uh, I saw a lot of emerging platform also that are curating AR pieces are NFTs. And um, so, um, of course, I think that if there is a way to regulate the fact that you own those virtual spaces or you have a say like saying something, like you have any sort of level of authority on the, on the virtual space that comes with the physical space that you're delivering, I think that would be something that I would like if I were in a practice of design. So um, definitely positive about that, but you know, feel free to follow up with me. I'm, I'm happy to provide more details about what I think. I saw some hands before, I'm not sure it went up and down. But feel free to, I'm very happy to answer to anyone. Yeah, I guess Alessio, I, I have a question um, as well. And maybe this is uh, totally unfair, uh, but what do you think the, uh, the issues are with um, integration of AR? I mean, the most uh, famous sort of standard AR thing was uh, Pokemon Go, you know, as uh, as as it is it uh, infrastructure? Is it the fact that Hololenses are totally expensive and a little little clunky and hard to use? Or what are the what are the factors of why you know this hasn't taken off per se? Well, to answer to that, I have to say that the last week uh, the U.S. Army signed a 22 billion contract for Hololens devices. Uh, so I think it's taking off, but uh, it's taking off on very not mainstream uh, field. And uh, it's not impacting maybe in the best way uh, as it should be. Like there is a lot of potential, but it's, uh, let, let, let's think about it in, in this way. You will use it 
continuously if it's something that has the same equivalent of usage as your smartphone or computer. Uh, at this point in time, using a, using a smartphone, or a smartphone, sorry, or a computer is much more pleasant. Like, no way. Like, there is no other way to, to put it differently, right? But for very specific cases right now, augmented reality is targeting a lot of enterprise market, and uh, there are, are emerging a lot of use cases. Uh, for example, warehouse uh, labeling system, for example, healthcare, where you need your hands free meanwhile you're working, so you don't want to check computer continuously every time. So it's kind of going slowly toward that direction. Uh, what Pokemon Go did, in my opinion, is also like starting to interface this technology with uh, locations I'm, and was my uh, very first excitement of augmented reality. They are getting always more detailed, um, uh, especially with some, uh, and I want to just mention the example of App Apple or Facebook, which they are really pushing the fact that augmented reality can recognize spaces in a very instantaneous way, thanks to LIDAR technologies and the matching of images around you with artificial intelligence. And even there, there is a lot of uh, um, a lot of discussion in terms of privacy because you are actually who is giving to these companies the, the, the strength to do it through your images, through your photos, through what you see. And so they are kind of trying to get always the most data out of you, but without that, it's not working that great. So it still requires so much time to get where we are expecting to get like that. That's a reality, of course, and I, I wouldn't expect everyone now to use smart glasses any sooner. I have my hand raised. Can you see it? Oh, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Alessia, thank you so much. Um, I did a talk that kind of referenced some of the problems with being too much in the simulacra uh, and not connecting back, and you mentioned the problem, so I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Um, but I also, what you presented is incredibly seductive, incredibly um, fascinating, definitely something we need to be looking into. Um, but like there were some questions in the 1970 Aspen Design Conference when there was a crisis in ethics about whether or not we as designers and architects should be in service to industry or should be in service to society. When we are leading with these trends, technological trends, um, how much is it, or is it too early to ask about and your possibilities uh, in predicting potential pitfalls um, that, you know, similar to what happened with Facebook when they didn't realize that these virtual realms, and I'm thinking of foundation as well, <laughs> um, but the, the pitfalls when we're not thinking about the repercussions of things taking over. Okay, so yeah, uh, first of all, I, I saw your documentary about the World Expo. Oh, you did? <laughs> I was there, I oh. think, and congratulations on that and all your research. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you. to talk to you directly, it's great. And um, uh, I think that, uh, well, you know, like, I have very close friends that are in design and they they are very, every time that I bring up stuff about the mental reality, virtual reality, they really, um, they will say, they basically indirectly are saying, you're the ruin of our profession. Like you're the ruin of uh, what, what is happening now because you're going, you're going places. You're not actually bringing up what we did until now. You, you're just like converting kind of something like that. But you discovered that in the industry of tech right now, there are so many product designer engineers that comes from an architecture background. Why is that? Uh, because uh, they have, uh, uh, because architects have a very good experience with 3D modeling software, we all knowing, but also we have a very good understanding of space. And right now, uh, interfaces are getting spatial. So who's best in, uh, in defining where should be what, right? Something like that. Us, us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, well, Alicia, I think they, we need to start wrapping up is the thing. I think we're, we're behind schedule and my apologies for-, for No worries, uh, no worries. I can follow up. Uh, just to finish up, basically what I want to say is that I really think that if you want to make a change uh, as a designer or anything, you just need to get the wider, the wider spectrum 
of things that you can change and then like channel your energy toward a certain direction. And I think that in my career, I'm approaching it this way. Uh, there are many other ways to do it. Uh, I just think I want to be there uh, and I want to be listened. Uh, so that's why I am trying to go toward uh, understanding of design that is very technical for kind of building some infrastructure behind what I want to build in the future. But definitely for me, like, you know, like uh, to, un as I hope it answered to your questions, uh, but um, I don't think that there is uh, someone institutional or not institutional, there is just your, your influence in the, in the, in the, in the environment. Yeah.